Joe, I don't you can hear me. Okay. You hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Let me turn the volume up. I'm still at David's. Did you get my message? Uh, I got your address. No, no. The, 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 they oh, asked me yes. how to come up because the building is still messed up. There's tarps all over the place. I'm glad you reminded me of that. I, anyways, well, Linda's here. Joe, I've got a collect uh, from Second Sunday in Advent, one we get going here shortly. I'm wondering if you'd be willing to lead it. It'll be in print. I've got it in print. It'll be in front of us. Oh, okay. Nigel can't be with us. He's traveling. His son and daughter-in-law just had a baby, so. Oh. Oh, by the way, I've got a 1604 Book of Common Prayer done in leather. Uh, it, in fact, it's done in the old, in the old script and everything. Oh my! Wow. Good to see you, Linda. Good to hear from you. You're one of the Reformed band of brothers and sisters. Well, was, Joe, I just got a message. Moments ago, from an REC man in Atlanta. And he's a lawyer. He's a member of the church. He's shifting. He went from Baptist to Presbyterian to REC. Hmm. I think I saw and him on uh, Low Church Anglican. Didn't he write something? Matthew Bryan? Oh, okay. I, I know who Matthew Bryan is, yeah. Well, he has opposed the rector, the rector who is Anglo-Catholic-ish and also pushing for Sutton's union efforts with Rome. Yeah, well. And so the rector has barred him from the Lord's Supper. And I'm encouraging him to stay and fight, not to retreat, mm -hmm. provided, provided his family's okay. Mm -hmm. If it's his family, then he needs to go. But if he can, I don't want him to lose his joy, his confidence, his reformed faith, but to stand up and make an issue. Yes. Well, so there's more information yet to come. My question about that, does he have any other families that feel the same way he does down there? Yes. Yes. Okay. They ought to get together and have morning prayer, evening prayer, uh, sometime during the week, or do something. Form a strong brotherhood there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in there, and uh, see if they can get a minister or You know, the Orthodox Church does a strange thing. I think that's good counsel. Huh? That's good advice. Mm -hmm. Well, I said the Orthodox Church, or the Greek Orthodox Church did a strange thing at one time. I don't know if they're still doing it, but they would ordain priests who were not allowed to give sermons. Mm. In the Orthodox Church? Yeah. They would or they, they would generally for country churches and things of this nature, and they would order them and, and they can do the divine liturgy. But you know, they weren't in a, uh, in a teaching role. I got you. Now, within Anglicanism, I wish I'd known this year before and had uh, access to the uh, homilies. For a long time, you couldn't find the homilies anywhere. Now they're online, there's all kinds of things. I use them all the time for sermons. I take and uh, modernize them and uh, leave off a lot of the extraneous stuff. Yeah. But they're very good. Uh, and then, uh, again, there's Bullinger Decades. You know, and uh, these ministers or these services do not have to do it without a sermon. The 
old Virginia churchman, uh, churchmanship uh, of the colonial period, and probably even beyond, they oftentimes didn't have ministers, or one minister would be serving several parishes and he could only get there once a month or once every couple of months or something like that. And they would have lay readers who would read these sermons hmm. from the Book of Hamlet's. I'll tell you something, they, they'd get a much better education than they're getting in most seminaries today. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the many ideas that they could do. I mean, they could have a uh, morning prayer. Now, if uh, he, he does that, I wouldn't mind going down to Atlanta once in a while to for Holy Communion if they want to do that. And if other ministers would do the same thing. Sure, 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 sure. Sure, T Atlanta's maybe 10 hours from me. Well, it's a little bit further from me. But I do it. I don't, you know, I have no problem. Yeah. Yeah, well, union with Rome is unbelievable to my ears for the REC. It well, hasn't gone far. It's all super secret, but mm -hmm. there's communications with the, I think it's called the Dicastri office in the Vatican, and Sutton's the, the leading the charge. Mm -hmm. And it's gotten down to the local level at this parish in REC. Just before I came on, I was going to find out, see if I could find the particular parish. I have invited Matthew and I to start a start a start pick a fight with this guy, and even even move towards removing him from office. Now he's going to hey Paul, um, he's going to raise it with Bishop Willie in Charleston, but he doesn't think Willie will do anything. Also, he's he's meeting with uh, Aaron Long either this weekend or the next weekend. He may be traveling somewhere, so we'll see. Let me ask you a question. A little bit talk to uh, Bishop Bishop Schlish. Yes, uh, I read somewhere, and I just oh. said something to uh, Phil about the Orthodox Church in Greece used to ordain at one time uh, priests. They weren't allowed to give sermons, but they could do the divine liturgy. Do you know anything about that? No, I've never heard of that. Now, I was raised in a Russian Orthodox church, and uh, a deacon could assist the priest in the divine liturgy, but only the priest could uh, consecrate the communion, and a deacon was allowed to preach, but they weren't allowed to do uh, communion. And Paul, keep me in the loop on the Greek classes as an aside. Oh, sure. Yeah. Sure, I'll send you out. So uh, so what were you saying, Joe? The Greek Orthodox had a priest who could preach but not do the consecration? No, they could They could do the consecration, divine liturgy, but they couldn't preach. No, I never heard of that. that that's a, Maybe that's... There are some little variations between the Greek Orthodox and Russian Orthodox, too. They're not... Well... They're, I don't know at what century this was going on, but it was, yeah. they, they, they talking, well, what yeah, I had uh, read was, was talking see. about the uh, shepherds, people in the countryside who didn't have uh, large congregations. Well, that's quite possible, but no, I, I had never heard of that in my reading of Orthodoxy. There's a few people that they ought not let preach anyway. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, well, this is a new development with this guy being barred from the table for opposing this union effort with Rome. That is, and by the way, as maybe you've seen, I've been doing some research on the old RECers, and Pro I visited Prof. George Handy Wales's cemetery three hours north and had a delightful engagement there, but also at why Tomico Presbyterian, I had a tremendous interaction with the people there. And then I had yesterday 
a church historian from the Presbyterian Church there, as well as the president of Pemberton County something, Historical Society. And she's going to do more research on the Wales family, the Leonard family, and the Rich Riches family, which are interwoven and go back in uh, Virginian history to 1606, which didn't make any sense to me. 1606 was before Virginia was founded. I know. Well, 1607 was uh, 1607 was Jamestown, right? Yeah. <laughs> at, any, at any rate, that's for the future. But uh, oh, Graham's here. Good, good, good. Um, mm -hmm. Anyways, he was a stalwart man at Reformed Episcopal Seminary for forty-one years, and so that's emerging. Also, Joe, I'm doing research on Cummins. And I would strongly recommend reading uh, his wife's biography of about 500 pages. It's on Joe Busfield's website. I can send that to you. This man loved, he was, he was well loved in the Episcopal Church. He wasn't some crazy man. Um you know, a tub thumper when he founded the, the Reformed Episcopal Church in 1873, he was deeply loved with very influential congregations. Joe Christ Church in Norfolk, now it's merged with St. Luke's. He was the rector there for a few years. He went to St. James Episcopal in Richmond with an extremely successful ministry. Is St. James the one right there about the Capitol building? Yes. Okay. Yeah. See, I mean, you can, and then he got called to the famous Trinity Episcopal in Washington, D.C. Now, they, they that building burned down and, and was uh, closed in 1918, but it had a lot of senators and judges and influential government people. So mm -hmm. Bishop Cummins was not a back, back, backwoodsman by any means. He then went to Baltimore, St. Peter's, and he was there. He declined a call to Trinity Church in New York City. And he I, I put it on the website that lamentation of Bishop Mead in 1855, where he laments in a parlor, both sitting on a sofa, Bishop Mead to Reverend George Cummins at the time. He was 33 years old about the advancing tide of Oxfordism and Tractarianism. And he charged him, you will, I will never, I won't see it develop in my day, but you will, and you must resist it firmly and faithfully. Mm -hmm. And of course, well, the problem me, is John Johns, who followed Bishop Mead, didn't uh, take that advice. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm digesting all of this old historical stuff, and these were the pillars. These men stood in their time, and I'm I'm wrestling with the question of why do we do church history? Why do we do history at all? And by the way, Joe, you were going to loan me those books on the bishops in the Civil War when I'm going up. Here it is. Ah. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, he's a good historian. I'm going to be going up with Joe. I'm here in Newport News with my son. And Joe does Holy Communion up near Richmond. And Joe and I, Joe and I is, it, is it next week we're going to go? Yeah, it's not going to be this Sunday. It'll be next week. They're, the church is all messed up. They're completely redoing the plaster on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The church was built in 1830, so it's which, cool. which for the Englishmen, they don't bother... If it's in the 1800s, that's modern to them. <laughs> to, to us, it's historical. <laughs> but if let me do the share screening and we'll go for an hour. Is that good till 11? Sounds fine. Everybody? Yeah. Okay, let me get uh, this. Um, I want, uh, let me, how do I do this? Here's um, 
Joe, can you lead us maybe with one of these collects here in prayer? <clears throat> Second Sunday in Advent? Yeah, that's fine. I love that one. Mm. Okay. Uh, the Lord be with you. With thy spirit. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who hath called all caused all holy scripture to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of our holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 And just so you all know, these are taken out of the old 1930-ish REC prayer book. But so, and maybe Paul or Graham, you could do one of these in closing. You see, I've included it in our work. And then, by the way, this, Yay. Uh, this thing, I, I've got a screen coming because I it's very, I'm in a little side room at my son's house. It's very... I have a 10, a 10 foot by six foot wall tapestry coming. So this is in the future going to be hanging behind me. Oh, um, right. I should have included you in there slash sister, but we understand you're involved too, Linda. And well, you know, I'm afraid about that. Yeah, and you said plus one sister or something like that. What? One. That was all. Just plus one. It's all. Plus one. Okay. <laughs> Jesus, how do I end? And he said, plus one. In my mind, I went, oh my goodness. <laughs> okay. I've gone through here. As you know, this is uh, Nigel can't be with us, but all the bold stuff is his writing. Oh, wow. And we did the preamble um, that Christ calls us to be and labor for consonants with the word of God. We talked last time about apostolic succession. So I'm going to go down to where we pick up. Um, I'll just notice that here's some of the modern heresies we should be able to identify. Mm -hmm. A little joking tune there. It's our solemn mm -hmm. duty to understand what is a true church. And then we got down here um where we would pick up now let's just uh take a look at this and see what we think uh the recs were definitely against the tractarians because it was romanism um i'm gonna add here so feel free to jump in If you haven't read, Bishop McGilvane's Oxford Divinity, I sent, I think, a note on that. I certainly highly recommend it, especially for the clergyman. It's about 30 or 40 bucks in hard copy, and it can be found on internet.org. This is it published in 1841 by uh, Bishop McGilvane, right there. Mm -hmm. He was friends with Bishop Cummins. And again, for Joe and Graham with the FCREC connections, mm -hmm. I say again, Bishop Cummins was highly prized, highly loved, well-known. In fact, after the Civil War, I think they sent him to be assistant bishop in Kentucky to help bring reconciliation after the Civil War. Um, but the, the main thing that he was against was tractarianism. Mm. So I think we're 
still called to stand up for the Reformation doctrine of justification by faith, oops, by faith alone. Not just justification by faith, but by faith alone. There's hmm. a difference there. Mm -hmm. So we need to, uh, and see this SSC churchman? Those are, that's the society of Sanctus something, I forget now. I thought it was Sacred Cross. Sacred Cross. Sacre uh, something. Yeah, Sacred Society of Sacred Cross. They were the shock troops. The the uh, They were in the vanguard of pushing Tractarianism. Well, guess who belongs to that? Um, Bishop Ackerman and others are SSC churchmen that that are allowed, even tolerated in the ACNA. I don't. I think the way to look at our ACNA is that it's a broad church. And as Chuck Collins told us last time, they do everything they can to skate around or get around the 39 articles. Mm -hmm. Now, that's different than that one diocese up in the Northeast, uh, Diocese of the Living Word, headed by Julian Dobbs. But I don't see anything in YouTubes or in publications that stresses Reformation, the English Reformation. I just don't see it unless you see it. Um, as for wafer worshipers, uh, we, we've talked about Sutton. He's into that. Mm. Um, he's into baptismal regeneration head for head as sacerdotalist. Don, what do you could you explain to me a little bit more when you say wafer worshipers? Uh, could you elaborate on that a little bit for me? What yeah, that means? Christ, Christ transubstantiation. Tra oh, it's transubstant similar to transubstant transubstantiation. Then yeah, yeah, it's I could pejoratively call it the bone muncher cruncher view that you're chewing on his body. And you got his literal blood swilling around on your tongue. And that there's been a magic moment where the priest presbyter utters the words and prayer of consecration and it becomes, and the, and the key word is ontological change. Okay. Um, I'll just throw that in. We used to call them bone munchers. Is that something that came from Cramner? <laughs> well, it's funny that you... Let me just finish this note. But... I'll just put the HC service, Holy Communion. Funny you mentioned that, Joe. Uh, Dr. Cranmer had a go around with Bishop Bonner when they were charging him, Bishop Bonner. They threw him in jail. How nice is that? Oh. He'd come back with a vengeance under Mary. He said to Bishop Bonner, do you eat the ears of Jesus? Mm -hmm. Do you eat his nose? <laughs> do you eat his eyes? You chew on his feet. And Bishop Bonner came back at Cranmer repeating the standard Roman justification for transubstantiation. Now, it's alleged by some historians that Cranmer went through three phases. He went through, the, he was devoutly Roman Catholic and familiar with the Serum Missal since youth. And that then he passed through a Lutheran phase on the question of real presence and then passed to the Reformed view, which he definitely held by 1548. Now, I think uh, 
drawing a blank now, Peter or something. A historian claims that three-stage view. At Cranmer's trial, they threw that up against him. Yes. Look, Cranmer, you're unstable. You were Roman Catholic. You became Lutheran on the table. And then you became Reformed. And he denied that. He denied that he was a three-stager and affirmed that he was a two-stager. And then he repeated his Reformed view. So that by 1549, that's what his view was when the prayer book came out. He was upset and put off by Bishop Stephen Gardner, also called Wiley Winchester, who was the nemesis of Cranmer, and who Henry VIII excluded from being an executor of his will. Henry VIII knew how to use Stephen Gardner. He was a crafty man. Um, in fact, <laughs> while we're talking about that, Dr. Cranmer called him shifty. <laughs> quote, unquote. <laughs> Dr. Cranmer also called him a juggler. Mm. Um, and at one point said, uh, you're just a, a lawyer, a canon lawyer. You're not a theologian. And Wiley Winchester was not particularly creative he was, as a theologian, but he was dead opposed to where Cranmer was going. And so when the 1549 prayer book came out, he laughed at Cranmer and said, hey, I'm a English Roman Catholic. I can use that book as well as, as a Reformed person can. And Cranmer was upset that he his prayer book could be read by English Roman Catholics mm -hmm. um, acceptably. And of course, that was a part of what he fixed that in the 1552 vision, take, eat this bread in remembrance that Christ died for thee. Um, so, um, bone muncher, cruncher, a good point. He did that with Bishop Bonner. Now that's, we know Sutton has gone all, has been, has been there for 24 years. Um, uh, well, Don, uh, just to interject a little bit there. Yeah. Uh, can, you, can you hear me all right? Mm -hmm. I'm out in a, on, I'm, a, I'm on a pig farm. <laughs> I'm not sure if you can hear me. I can um, hear you. The, um, there's a subtle sort of uh, nuance to this um, real presence, isn't there? In the insofar as um, I, I forget the term they use for it, but there is such a thing as the uh, presence of the Lord spiritually um, connected to the breaking of bread and the pouring out of the wine. Um, in terms of um, what the Lord uh, intended us to to see in that. In other words, um, as we break the bread, we are to remember his broken body. Mm -hmm. Not to say that the body, the bread is his broken body, but <laughs> it it's um it's a power it's such a powerful reminder mm -hmm. of the broken body that um it, it's that that uh, helps us to think of and think on an experience. The um the broken the broken body or the effects of the broken body of our Lord. Hey, do, do, do you remember the term that's used for that? It's it's a spirit it's a spiritual presence, of course. Yes. But uh, very closely related to the breaking of the bread and the pouring out of the wine. I mean that that's what the Lord Jesus um intended when he set mm -hmm. apart the bread and the wine. He said, "This is my body." So. You know, it's sacerdotal language, sac sacramental language for the, re the the real presence. Yeah. The reformers believed, grammar might be a little more realistic, or Calvin, I should say, but Christ is present. That's yeah. 
he's there spiritually, yeah. spiritually he's present doesn't he? absolutely but and i would add um present by way of our soteriological union with christ that yeah. was a dominant theme in saint paul's literature our union christ is with us and yeah. dr ashley null stresses union with christ coming out of friend it's not a matter that christ flew off with the pigeons from the bell tower um which is what fennec accuse us of we just we reduce it to this mere memorial event yeah. no there's an energy thank god of the holy spirit drawing us back to the cross amen yeah uh, well um fennec goes um wrong where he says um as we break the bread and pour out the wine we the church or the or more accurately the celebrant namely the bishops, really, but assisted by the presbyters, they are actually thereby, as they break the bread, as they pour out the wine, they're thereby offering the broken body of the Lord and his shed blood to the Father. So it becomes an offering that we are making to God through our celebration of the, the Lord's Supper. Whereas yes. in actual fact, the, the direction of... Um, the whole ceremony is not from us to God, but God to us. <laughs> you know, he's actually got the arrow pointing in the wrong direction. It's not <laughs> us doing something before God, but some reminding ourselves of something that God has done for us. <laughs> the arrow is pointing down from God to uh, us. <laughs> that sounds like double speak to me, offering the broken body and blood to God. Yeah, this is this is how he regards the um, communion as what he calls a bloodless sacrifice. He's not suggesting we're offering the blood to God, but he's um, he's interpreting it as us um, by breaking the bread and pouring out the wine. We are reminding God. We're sort of like assisting Jesus to uh, present his body and his blood. To the Father, we are the church is assisting the the the, the Lord Jesus to present His um, finished work to the Father. It's, it's very um, it's very subtle, but it's very um, very uh, misleading as well, and and mm -hmm. and and close to um, the the whole uh, reformed uh, objection to um, to to the. Uh, uh, transubstantiation. I mean, it's not that different from transubstantiation, really. Um, and as for RECFC ears, the old ones, this Christ's presence in Holy Communion was rejected as a Tractarian return to Rome. Um, and Cummins was certainly not alone in rejecting that. Yeah. Um, not at all. And here we sit in 2024 talking to ourselves when 99, nearly 100% of people, this goes way over their head. Yeah, I mean, the average the average uh, communicant doesn't even know mm -hmm. half the time what, what the, the, the bishop thinks he's doing. You know, the bishop doesn't stand up and say, well, this is what I'm actually doing for you. <laughs> He doesn't declare himself that that clearly. So the poor um, average man in the pew is totally unaware of the um, d distortion of the of the communion celebration that's going on. I want to. I'm reading Alistair McGrath's got a book here side. I think it's the history of heresy. Let me see here. A History of Defending the Truth, Heresy. And he raises what these doctrines do to people. Um, 
it destabilizes, it destroys, it diminishes. It can come in very gently with a few drops of poison to the cup mm -hmm. or a planted germ. And so I want to think about how does this destabilize? Well, I think it just turns people off to get into intricate debates over it. Um, and yet we have to draw a line here. What was Jesus' intent in John 6? And if we raise these things, Fennec with, uh, Fennec with, or Graham, if we raise these with Fennec or we raise it with Sutton, we may end up like my friend being excommunicated from the church. Yeah. Who, who was excommunicated? Well, I I, also, I won't say excommunicate. Um, Matthew Bryan. Oh, lawyer, yeah, I know him. I've heard of him. Lawyer. Well, our, our, our group of churches have, in effect, been excommunicated because we will not go along with all this stuff. Hmm. So he's told us we we are no longer members of um, the denomination. But we've never accepted that because... Um, it, it was never done with any sort of consultation hmm. with us. And uh, by convocation, it was just done by him issuing a decree. Did he use that as word? If, as, if, as if he is the church. Hmm. Did not he... so much Fennec. It was actually um, his predecessor, uh, Ken Powell. Ken Powell went to a solicitor, and he got this jolly certificate, which... Um, isn't worth the paper it's written on. But this certificate said uh, we are not members. Hmm. So what happened to Matthew Bryan, Don? Well, Sutton, Shifty, the juggler, um, and I called that. I've watched him since 1985 for those. I knew more about him than the REC did. <laughs> um at any rate, he is secretly pursuing some kind of union communion agreement with Rome. And he's right. in touch with one of the offices in the Vatican. He's been over to the Vatican with Foley Beach in these secret discussions. And Rome is open to validating Anglican orders only for Orthodox Anglicans who will not ordain women and who will not allow gay ordinations. So that is being discussed. Well, it, it has ended up from that exalted mountain-like level, so to speak, down to the parish level at an REC church in Atlanta. And some of the parishioners are upset, including Matthew. And he's created a stink and he's posted on Facebook his opposition to this. And the rector has barred him from the table at Holy Communion. Oh. Some of the parishioners are with Matthew and they're disgusted and before you arrived Joe Mailer and I were chatting about how they should handle that one of the things was for Matthew to gather people together maybe during the week to build a bond of fellowship mm -hmm. and maybe uh, in time do something with respect to the rector. Now, I told Matthew that he needs to stay and fight on one condition, that it does not affect his family. If it affects his wife or any of his kids, he needs to move along or into safer territory. But if the, putting that to, so that, I was very strict about that with him because I'm a Navy chaplain who lost a lot of time with my family. Mm -hmm. And so family time is a big deal to me. Uh, you can't put them in jeopardy. 
Um, I also encouraged him. And he said I was free to mention all this in today's meeting. He couldn't join us. Mm -hmm. um, but he said to stay and fight. He's going to talk to Bishop Willie in Charleston, but he doesn't expect any action from there. Willie's not the sharpest uh, in the toolkit. Does, so he, uh, does Bishop Willie ordain women? No. Nor does the REC. Okay. Um, but they're part of the uh, Anglican Church of North America, and they do. Yeah, and yeah. part of what this REC, part of the REC rector's complaint against Matthew was that this REC rector is advising that they not break union with the ACNA over women's ordination. Mm -hmm. So just go along to get along. Matthew says no to that as well. So it's really two issues that are going on. Union with Rome by Sutton. And let's not break fellowship over women's ordination. And this comes back to this, you know, our solemn duty to understand biblical truth and heresy. I'm going to add here. I want to get a 21st century edition of heresies, apostasies, and weak points. I guess I'll use that word. For example, Bultmanianism, this is off track from where we're at, but I went to Bruton Parish two, three weeks back, morning prayer, and they read Matthew 4, Jesus quelling the storm on the Sea of Galilee. Mm. We read it, and then the rector got up and started talking about five minutes in. He said that never happened. <laughs> uh, Je Jesus didn't still the storm. And then off he went into some kind of soft universalism that we're all brothers and sisters, uh, which in one sense is true. And in a redemptive sense is heresy. Um, anyways, I want to get an update. What does it mean? Which is what. Nigel is saying we need to know the characters and signs of Christ's true church. That's a big question. Mm -hmm. so where do we draw lines? Uh, the true church speaks biblical truths, not lies and deceits. And this has been recurring amongst us. Um, apostolic doctrine is apostolic succession and, and are there different kinds of churches now the Westminster Confession says that there's no such thing as a pure church that all churches are some mixture of truth and error but that in true churches they're more pure than impure and, you know, we're going to expect in the church, there's going to be tares and, and wheat. And Jesus mm -hmm. tells us not to rip up the tares. Then we got to deal with issues like when do we excommunicate or bar at the table? Anybody want to add anything to this section here? No, I, th I think that's... Uh... That's key, uh, Don, is the, um, the realization that the visible church, the organized church that we be churches that we belong to, are a mixed bag. They'll, they'll never all be converted people. And the, I guess the difficulty comes when um, the majority and certainly the leadership are in the hands of unconverted people. That, that's what's <laughs> happened in... Um, in Anglicanism, I think the unconverted people have exalted themselves into the position where they now call the tune mm -hmm. and they tell the lay people, the man in the pew, the women in the pew, what they're to believe and what what's actually going on in the sacraments. You know, that, that, that's, that's the, the situation we're in here in the Free Church of England is we're being told by the 
by the leadership that this is the kind of church we are. We we believe in um, sacerdotalism, but we don't. You know, the the grassroots members don't. I think it's a I question think... of uh, rallying them around and getting them to voice that that uh, objection. I think this comes up later in Nigel's paper down below, where the few at the top control what happens at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And it's disproportionate. Yeah. Um, and I, I, and this is for Joe Mailer, by 2000-2000 in Shreveport, Louisiana, when there was any doctrinal discussion in Cranmer Theological House, like baptismal regeneration, in which Sutton taught that all infants are are converted and justified and then that then it was questioned what do you mean justified and converted the bishop hath spoken hmm. and he was bringing in fed, the federal vision idea and then he went on to explain well we're informal a baby is informal informally converted inform it's an informal justification and Reverend Mark Winder went back and forth in the, the answer on several issues, including this uh, wafer worship, which Sutton was teaching. Uh, some One of the students poured the, the after a Holy Communion down the drain, and Ray Sutton lost his temper, abusively so, against this student to the shock of all the other students, there's a handful of them, you're you're pouring Christ's blood down the drain. Well, he was teaching transubstantiation or trans elementation. Um, but there was control at the top, mm -hmm. which excluded those at below. And uh, I think I forget who said it. Fascism, they dazzle the simple and they silence the intelligent. Mm -hmm. I've expanded it to say that tyrants dazzle the simple, abuse any questioners to silence them, and those who persist, they get rid of. That's mm -hmm. exact pattern. Mm -hmm. Leonard Riches, the narcissist, who drove out yeah. all kinds of people. Old at which, at, at which point, Don, sadly, um, many of the good men do throw in the towel and say, "Okay, well, if that's if that's the way you want to carry on church leadership, then um, I'm out of here." <laughs> yeah, they kind of hand hand the denomination over to these tyrants who um who then uh, are free to um to do precisely that you know get rid of the good men yes i just wanted to just take a second to read from the 39 articles which would deal with on the sacraments in general it says sacraments were not ordained of christ to be gazed upon or to be carried about, but that we should duly use them. And here's the key sentence. And in such only as worthily receive the same, they have a wholesome effect or operation. And that contradicts automatic baptismal uh, regeneration. Uh, you have to worthily receive the same. Yes. It's only after time that we see whether the Spirit of God calls that baptized child to... Mm -hmm. um, genuine faith so that's the 39 articles they're solid there uh and it says the same thing on communion later on such as worthily receive them mm -hmm. they have you know a whole wholesome of, of, uh, effect and uh so you're right don we have to we have to stick with that i mean the the writing in the 39 article there i think is fine but it seems like some folks are straying away from that yes um the Westminster standards have the same nuance there, Paul. Those that worthily receive the cup, those that worthily 
um, respond to the sign and seal of the covenant. Um, and this goes back to Matthew Bryan. What should he do? And many of us ended up being driven out. I know when I left this is for Joe Mailer in 2005, I'd just gotten out of the Navy. And I started doing research on what happened to my denomination. And when I saw that APA REC merger, and I saw the Unity Mass, now it, and the guy Bishop Grunsdorf was the APA Archbishop. He was an SSC churchman, uneducated guy. And here's Leonard Riches joining with Tractarians completely in opposition to the foundational principles of the REC. I said, I can't, you know, I was down at Camp Lejeune and retired. and I had no church down there, nothing. And I just, I was alone on an island. And I said, I, I just can't do it. So I sent a letter to Bishop Gillen. And I said, please take my name off the clergy roster, which is and now I think my, Graham, my credentials are allegedly FCEEC with the South Americans. At least I was told they were. <laughs> so Joe, you got out of the REC in 2000 before I did, um, but it, they drove off good men. And to Graham, um, I look at Dr. Sandlin, who was joined the FCE and he and Rossello, they pulled out, Dr. Sandlin doesn't even wanna talk about the FCE and whatever he discovered. I would just love to talk to Dr. Sandlin, mm -hmm. but it was abuse. Yeah, he, he's, um... He's just recently declined the invitation to join us on uh, the 31st when we are planning uh, some sort of consultation with those who um, are uh, still holding out a little bit of hope for the FCE. Because my, my, my standpoint is that, um, you know, we've never recognized Finnick and um, we've come to discover since um, Fennec uh, took over, that even some of his colleagues um, didn't uh, or, or grew to uh, re be very uh, sorry that they'd allowed or encouraged Fennec to join us. Um, the late Bishop um, John McLean is uh, reported to have uh, said to some of his close um, friends in the denomination, that he bitterly regrets the fact that he aided and abetted Phoenix uh, joining us and uh, rising to the place he, he now has. Now, if that, is, if that spirit is still there in the denomination in sufficient force for God to fan into flame some sort of a repentance and return to the um, founding principles of the denomination. Mm -hmm. There is a glimmer of hope for the Free Church of England um, because uh, the majority could perhaps then turn around to Fennec and say, "Look, you know, we just don't recognise you. You know, you've ta you're trying to take the denomination down a path that we're not prepared to go down, and that we've been created to actually withstand." But time will tell whether that's going to take place or not. But um, coming back to Peter Sanlon, he, um, he's just indicated to me that he doesn't believe that that's a battle he wants to fight. And in fact, he and his church have um, uh, resigned from the Free Church of England and they've joined a Presbyterian group. I don't know oh. what, what it is, but they've joined a Presbyterian group. So that's Peter Sanlon, sadly. But I think if people like Dr. Sanlon uh, could make a stand, that would greatly strengthen the um, the 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 movement because um, the, the objections to Phoenix leadership. Because um, Peter Sanlon is a a highly recognised um, biblical writer. You know, he's he's um, authored books for. 
the Banner of Truth, which is a very highly respected reformed uh, publishing house here in England. You know, Graham, I've been doing this research on Bishop Cummins. I don't know where his papers are. They are not at Reformed Episcopal Seminary, according to Dr. Gelzo. But Dr. Gelzo won't tell me or hasn't told me where they are. I'm going up to his grave here. I'm in touch with the cemetery. Um, long story there. But if you read his wife's biography of George Cummins, there is something in that man that burns. Mm. Burns with a love for Jesus. You can, it's palpable on the pages. He has a desire to catechize, to visit, to give the gospel, to see people converted mm -hmm. to Christ. Now, the new bishop of uh, the ACNA, Steve Wood, allegedly has the same kind of desire, although he ordains women and mm -hmm. charismatics in his diocese. And I'm talking about tongues type. Mm -hmm. uh, but you will see a different spirit in Bishop Cummins. No wonder people were drawn to him and drawn to Christ through him. Um, I don't see that with my REC. I didn't see it with Leonard Riches. Loveless Lenny, I call him. I think he's a, clinically a narcissist. Well, what about um, that brother who joined us uh last time we met uh chuck i think his name was yeah um what's happened to him is he with us today or not no he's not i don't know where he is i know he's unhappy with acna and he complains that they don't want to be close to or near the 39 articles and he's fighting against that now, he also supports women's ordination hmm. but i think he I had some communication. I'm thinking of going down to interview Bishop Fitzsimmons Allison, if I can arrange it with him to interview him uh, on a Zoom. Um, I've also, Graham and Joe Mailer, invited Bishop Gillen, retired REC bishop in Philadelphia, former chancellor of Reformed Episcopal Seminary, to do a Zoom interview. Not a single word back. Hmm. Uh, so I'm I'm up according. I I don't know if you all got the emails I sent last year about a hundred of them um, regarding Sutton's Anglican office book. I am told by a couple of insiders that my particular name, Donald Philip Veach, is very very well known among every ACNA, FCE, and REC bishop. I'm not unknown. Good. Because I kept writing the emails, and I'd include a couple of these heretical collects that deny the sacrificial and efficacious atonement of Christ. You pray, I need more merits from St. George or merits from St. Mary because Jesus isn't a sufficient atonement and sufficient advocate intercessor. So I'm well known. So, you know, a guy like Chuck Collins is pretty brave to come here like he did with my notoriety. <laughs> well, Panic I've got that, that over here too, uh, Don, your, your, um, we, we mentioned it last time. You remember I, I told you, uh, Bishop Joseph, Rossello, he's he's not too keen to be seen to associate too closely with um, his North American brothers. Hmm. I don't quite know why, but um, he reckons that uh, in some way or another, it's uh, detrimental to the um, to to what to what it is we're trying to achieve here, and that is. Um, get the church back uh, to its founding principles. He, he doesn't see these efforts and these talks that we're having as being positive in that direction at all. I don't know why exactly. I need to 
delve a little deeper into that why why it is he feels that um you you and the, the north american brothers are letting the side down in some way or another i suspect it might be um the fact that um it's a little bit uh, polemic in the sense of calling people names and stuff like that you know shifty satin and uh, razor blade richards richards he doesn't <laughs> like he doesn't like the polemic of it well razor blade riches let me do something here yeah i'm i'm a forensic theologian i'm westminster man that's that's the way i was trained so i can understand their reticence to be associated with a combat warrior uh, i get it well i think i think joseph is um is is a continental chap so he he's not british he's not um He's not offended in the way the British might be because of um, calling a spade a spade, because the British do tend to wrap stuff in cotton wool, you know. Mm. Uh, they don't always call a spade a spade. But um, Joseph is actually a Mediterranean chap. I think he's from, he's originally, from, well, he, he, he was in Argentina for a while, or South America anyway and headed up the South American uh, Anglican Fellowship there. But I think he came originally from, was it uh, Greece or? I think it was Spain. Spain. Spain, yeah, I think it was originally Spain. So he's not hes not a British sort of, um, you know, he's, he's not British in that sense of um, re being reluctant to call a spade a spade. He's he's pretty straightforward, as they are here in Yorkshire. The, the Yorkshire people are known for their bluntness and their straightforwardness. So I don't know why I don't know why Joseph is um, is saying what he's saying about uh, this fellowship. I really don't. I'm well, a, I'm just trying to find out. We have a TV show here in the U.S. called Law and Order Special Victims Unit. So I <laughs> yeah. made this. Uh, mean in the reform justice system theologically based offenses are considered especially heinous at Camp Lejeune which is where, where I live the dedicated detectives who investigate these vicious theological fel felonies are members of an elite squad known as the theological forensic unit these are their stories now that <laughs> kind of a meme is going to be offensive to to some and I, with Rossello, I agree, we need to be extremely positive like Bishop Cummins and irradiate the love of Christ and be involved in teaching and catechizing. And Yeah, I remember the South American brother, uh, Jesus uh, Espinoza. Yes. Uh, the, the bishop down there, he, he raised a question. Oh, when we first started talking to you guys, I think, he 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 just raised a question as to whether we were being a bit too um you know um what's the word uh, uh no, we're not being politically correct in the way we're going about things but it comes to a point though when uh, you have to call a spade a spade you know and, and uh, if you sort of um pussyfoot around too much People don't really know what it is you do stand for and what it is that you, you've you got problems with. You've got yeah. to call a spade a spade at one point. Um, uh, for Paul, uh, Peter Robinson said to Aaron that he'd rather have Veach coming straight at him with a hatchet <laughs> because, he's, because he's honest, yeah, direct. And you have to, and theologically astute, he gave me credit for that. And well, at, least, he, at least you know what you're dealing with was Peter's point. Whereas yeah, some at least of, the, in the Anglo-Catholic world, whence he came from, he said they're full of uh, backstabbers. You don't know who's 40 and we, against you. We, we call it in South Africa, we call it being mealy mouthed. Uh, <laughs> means you say one thing to one person because you think that will please them mm -hmm. and then in the next breath you say something totally contradictory to the next person because you think that'll please them so you're kind of like a chameleon saying 
different mm. things to different people depending on your audience, you know? Well, you know, in defense of myself, if I might, <laughs> again, I'm a Westminster man and we're trained. Our specialty is in defanging and declawing theological liberalism. We were trained, that's in our DNA. Now, is that a problem? Yep. We did not put, put out good preachers. We did not mm. put out good counselors. We had a joke at the seminary, which is a little crude and arrogant. We do the thinking, the evangelicals do the legwork. Well, <laughs> you know, we even though we're Machenites, and I'm going to be going up to Machen's grave here shortly, um, we still have to be loving and kind. And so that's a drawback in my own style. And I take Rosello's point on that. And I'm rebuked well, by that. No, I don't, I don't think um, I've, I've got um, the right to um, side with him, judging by, you know, you know, on, on the basis of the fact that he hasn't really spelled out why he's not happy with me talking to you guys. But, um, well, he's, you he's know, I suspect, I just, well, uh, he, is a, he is a charismatic. He believes in um, modern day, uh, I, won't, I won't call it prophecy, but um, uh. w words of knowledge and stuff like that, you know, <laughs> um, yeah. which of course is quite controversial. But, but I think his um, his concern is um, that uh, people will be offended not so much by what we say, but how we say it, and and that is a caution. I, I think to that extent we have to agree with him and say, yeah, we we mustn't be offending people by the way we're saying things. We must only be offensive by what we're saying, not how we're saying it. If we can make that distinction. I think we can be all right. So, I mean, the, the Apostle Paul didn't mince his words one bit when he wrote to the Galatians. And he says, um, at one point, he says, I wish these circ the circumcision party would, would emasculate themselves. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you couldn't put it more crudely than that, could you? I think he also said stupid Galatians. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, foolish, yeah. fool, foolish Galatians in a... Generally, the word that's translated fool in the Bible uh, is the Greek word moron. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, but they had a problem with Jesus Christ. I mean, he didn't miss words when he was talking to the scribes that, and the Pharisees. Oh. And, the, and the reformers, and too. Did, I mean, what, what did, um, what did uh, Martin Luther say about, about, about the Pope and people like that? He was very, very straight, wasn't he? Well, he was... He's crude. very insulting in his book, uh, uh, Bondage of the Will. He didn't miss yeah. more than that. Yeah, uh, that, that book is almost um, cover to cover, slating uh, Erasmus, isn't it? And the, our, we have martyrs in our lineage who did not give in. And well, we have... Yeah. Dr. We have Dr. Cranmer who said to Bishop Bonner, do you eat the ears, you eat the nose? Yeah, yeah, and we, we, we think also of the, um, the fact that um, our Lord called uh, Herod that fox. Oh. <laughs> I don't know what he meant by a fox, but a fox <laughs> in England is quite a cunning and um, slippery character. I think it's Philippians 3 1 where Paul says, Beware of the dogs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, we live in a society for some reason they've gotten very uh, tender feelings about what you say, uh, what words you use. Uh, you can call it political correctness. You can, but I think what it really is, is uh, trying to keep people from speaking honestly. Yeah, Ooh. and I would think the people in the church should be beyond that. True. Yeah. Well, the the bottom line is that sometimes we're more concerned about what people think of us than what we think the Lord thinks of us. You know, it's it's of of greater concern to us that some bishop or other is getting his feathers ruffled. Meanwhile, 
we're almost blaspheming the Lord in the process. You know that that's not right. We've got to get our we've got to get our priorities right here. Okay, brothers and sister Linda, we've gone over the eleven o'clock period. If okay. we can bring, bring it to a Let close. Let me just throw out uh, one last thing here. Okay, I did look at Galatians 3. I got my Greek Bible out. It's O Ano A Toy Galatai. Uh Ano it so the A ah means the ah, Noeti means the think, you know, mind think. And so mm -hmm. what Paul's saying there is un, you, you unthinking Galatians, is you could oh. probably literally translate yeah. it that way. Mm -hmm. I mean it's yeah. usually translated foolish, but it's it's literally you you're not thinking straight here. <laughs> unthinking Galatians. Yeah. Yeah. Is the adjective moronized? No, it's a different one. It's it's uh uh this one is, is ano at which which means you're not using your mind properly. Oh, I got gotcha. you. I, I, gotcha. I think I think also the word fool in in yes. the av translates a similar concept of um, somebody who's morally deficient, not necessarily intellectually deprived but morally deficient that's what the term means apparently and that that's true of these uh, bishops they are morally deficient that's right i mean at the end of the day they know jolly well what the reformers taught and they know jolly well what uh, cummins taught as well but they're flying in the face of it you know they they're actually uh, violating their own consciences because they know jolly well that the, the denomination was actually established on the basis of um, the Reformation. And never mind the Reformation, the, the biblical teaching on how, how does God make us right with himself. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they, they're they flying in the face of that, knowingly so. I mean, they, they're well aware. They're educated men. They're not, they're not intellectually deficient. They are morally deficient. I call oh, that's a good of that's a good word, moron. <laughs> I'm gonna put one more picture in before we close in prayer. I've created oh. some memes probably offensive to some. Um where is it at? Give me a second here. Right there, zero hats. I love it. Anyways, well, we'll pick up here in a couple of weeks. It's good for all of you. Yes. Yeah. Good. That's fine. Thanks, okay. guys, very well, much. Let, Lord would bless. you like me to, uh, to Don, yes. off, read a collect here? And I, I, for this Sunday, the seventh Sunday after Trinity is a good one. So how about if okay. I read that one? Yeah, yeah. And it goes, Lord of all power and might, who art the author and giver of all good things. Graft in our hearts the love of thy name, increase in us true religion, nourish us with all goodness, and of thy great mercy keep us in the same. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Which yeah. collect was that again? That's uh, uh, for the seventh Sunday of Trinity in, uh, okay. uh, in our 1928 book. I assume it's the same in the 1662. Probably, yeah. Uh... Okay, I'm brother and sister. Good. Um, Joe, can I, uh, Don, can I uh, ask you to set up our meeting on the 31st and possibly the 21st as well? Because we want to have a, um online penitential service in one of our churches on the 21st. On the 22nd, it's a Monday. On Monday. Could we yeah. use your extended um, service for that? Ab absolutely. Let me communicate with you privately to set up the Zoom link and get it for you in advance. I can do that today. And I will okay. want you to send me the title you want me using for the Zoom link. Okay, will do. Right. Thanks, Don. Yep. And brother and sister, good to be with you. Love you. And God talk bless. To God bless. Bye. Bye, Bye angels. Goodbye.